So this is sort of this kind of a continuation patient and healthcare. We expect our access to security a little bit. True story here. Population in the United States is getting older. In 1970, the year A, I don't know, phenomenal economics instructor that y'all may or may not know, uh, was born. The median age in the United States is 27.9 years old. That meant half of the country was younger than 27.9 years old. Half of the country was older than 27.9. But health improvements, we got out of Vietnam, what is that kind of stuff? In 2015, I need to look it up again. Dude, I forgot. Uh, in 2015, that number is 37.8. Half of the country is younger than 37.8. Half the country older than 37.8. That's 10 years worth of increase. So the younger half is 10 years older, so the older half is maybe 20 years older, right? For men, it's less than women because I think we, I can't remember what class we talked about that men kind of do stupid things. And we tend to do things like get ourselves killed doing some stupid things. So, and then we don't meet right. Age distribution in the United States, according to the 2010 census, which maybe we'll actually get a 2020 census, 2020. Anyway, but what ends up happening? Normally, you would expect, you know, the ends of these line, you'd expect it to sort of be like that. Because everybody's born. Almost everybody makes it to their first birthday, but not so many people make it to their 50th birthday, not so many people make it to their 100th birthday, right? You kind of expect this sort of a sort of steady progression thing, but that's not what ends up happening. What ends up happening? We have a bigger than normal group out here. Ooh, or is it bigger than all? Or is it that this group is smaller? Maybe this group is supposed to be out here. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. We would eyeball it. Those of y'all that take statistics and y'all need to talk about regression and uh, trend lines and that kind of stuff. That's kind of where things should be. Under 10 is smaller. Why? More people go to college. It's not that they stop having it, but more people go to college. And if you're in college, then you're less likely to have kids kid. Because you're in college. So what if you have more people that are waiting. We also have, luckily, a decrease in teenage pregnancy. And that's especially, I mean, that number's going to be even bigger now when we get the 2020 census because the, the teens aren't doing as much steaming up the windows in the back seat of a car because they're sitting at home texting one another, right? So there ain't even, how, how many of y'all had, had that know somebody in high school you see years prior to from health? That's a question here. Okay, uh, when I was teaching middle school, I had somebody in the graduate spread up. She got crazy had a baby question here. Nice. Uh, but the okay, so put Marcel's hand split up or whatever, but she's yeah, it, it, it's not happening as much. Teenage pregnancy is down. People waiting to go off to college. Or people waiting until they, they're going off to college and so they're waiting on having kids. That number is increasing. So, across the board, our birth rates are getting smaller in the United States. And so, consequently, this group is a bit smaller than it kind of should be. I'm really, inter in, really interested to see what that number is going to come out of the 2020 census, see how social media and that kind of stuff is changing things. Because y'all are sitting there texting one another and playing games and all that kind of stuff. What was the number I heard? Um, back as little as like 10, 15 years ago, it was like 80% of 16 year olds had their driver's license when they, when they were turned 16. But now it's like 25%. I mean, it's, it's 50 per, like 10 years ago, 50% of 16 year olds got their license. Now only 25% of 16 year olds get their license. Why? Did they change the rule? No, just we ain't that interested in driving because I don't need to drive anywhere because I hate the losers and the uh, ones that I do like. Yeah, I talk to them on a computer while I'm sitting at home streaming Netflix. Right? 
So is everybody staying home instead of riding around in cars and they're not in cars be seeing them back from windows to the back seat? Right. So I'm really curious as to how this is going down. Air traits are going down, so I'm really curious how that one's going to show up then. So this bird is smaller than average, but then what's going on here with these birds? They're bigger than they should be. Why? Well, who are they? That's baby boomers. Right? Uh, because this group is actually, well, part of it. Part of this group is smaller than it should be because, you know, from 1939 to 1945, people weren't having as many babies. So for that whole five year period, the number of babies was smaller than normal, but I guess the first half of the you know, late 30s, that number would have been higher because it was you know, the economy of going on. I guess we were in the Great Depression. But quick, so these numbers a little bit small because birth rates were smaller. But then these numbers, you got the baby murmurs coming in. So what's getting happening over time? Yeah, health is improving. So yeah, they're getting older and dying off, right? But there's more of them. So what's going to happen? These groups are going to be continuing to slide up. We're going to be a whole lot older in the not too distant future. And we talked about how that that's a way for people that's going to stop putting money into that social security bucket start taking out of it. Oh, crap, I just heard the numbers yesterday. I think it's like next year. Next year's 2020. Either 2020 or, yeah, I think it's 2020 or 2021. It's going to be the tipping point where more money is going to start leaving that bucket to going into that bucket. And they're talking by 2034, that bucket's not going to have enough money to pay it out. So what's this number? What, what's this graph going to look like? 20 years from now, you're going to have more baby boomers. This is going to be smaller than, well, don't exactly know what's going on here and then don't know what's going on there, right? So we might end up with looking at something like this sort of, I don't know. That's more jobs. Yep, yep. There's going to be more up, middle and upper management positions opening up as these people retire. And they're the ones that have been working for 20, 30 years, and they're going to have the promotions and management experience, that kind of stuff. So they're going to be running companies, they're going to be retiring. So it's an interesting time to be major in the business because there should be some openings. Gender distribution by age. For the population over 18 and 2015. This of the year 2015, I don't really need to update this. I'm sorry. 50, call 51% female, 49% male. The birth rates are 50 50. But what's happening? We're men, we do stupid things. All right. But this is so people over age 18. But if you look at the population over 65, almost 60% of them are female. Partially because we're, we men do stupid things, so we get killed off in our 20s and our 30s, so we don't make it that far. Or we, do, we don't do something too stupid, except for the fact that we're like vegetables. I ain't eating anything. Last time I ate something green and enjoyed it was crayon in second grade. And so then we end up having various heart attacks and that kind of stuff. So we end up stroking out before we turn 65. Well, this is where we are now. Yeah, we're not going to. But um, so let's see, World War II. Well, you know I'm saying like the oh. reason why it's lower is because it's been much more, and that's for population over 65. Yes. Okay. Um, dirty little secret. Um, World War II. How many Americans were killed in World War II? I want to say that number is 200,000. Not all that much. Not all that much. Compared to the 25 million Russians that were killed, not counting the other non combatant Russians that Stalin decided to kill off on the side, which was actually larger. Stalin killed more Russians during World, during World War II and a couple years after than Hitler did. But Germany lost something like 18 to 20 million. World War II was not 
the war that had the most American casualties? What war had the most American casualties? The Civil War. Everybody that got killed in the Civil War was American. I thought what you're talking about, like, but for like this age. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Talking about American American American. Okay. But, other, but this, and here's the other thing. Just, okay, give away our history for a minute. But the, but if you look over time in history, armies get bigger. You get to read about Washington and them all, and the, the, the battles of the American Revolution, it's a couple thousand people against a couple thousand people. Maybe five, six, eight thousand going up against five, six, eight thousand, something like that. Same thing to you. You go back to the Roman Empire and that kind of thing. You're talking, you know, the uh, uh, Roman legions only like 800 people. That's including the cavalry and all that kind of stuff. And so you've got a couple of legions going up against a couple thousand, but you get into World War One, World War Two, the armies are bigger. So you may end up having a situation where you've got hundreds of thousands of people shooting at one another in the same area at the same time. So you have that many more people. Like I said, the 25 million Russian combatants killed in World War II. But then we as Americans, well, this is crap. I don't know. I can't believe it. What did we as Americans actually do in World War II? Made weapons for everybody else. We made weapons for everybody else. As far as combat, you know, we got Syria. We, 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 you know, we hit the beaches in Normandy, July 1944. I mean, June 1944. The war was over less than a year later in Europe. We fought for like one year in Europe. We had some troops doing some stuff in Northern Africa. Okay, uh, how about out there in the Pacific? Well, we were really, we're not taking the Japanese at all seriously. Because we're like, we're going to concentrate our efforts on beating Hitler first, and then we'll come and we'll deal with the Japanese afterwards. And so, even after the U.S. Navy got bombed in Pearl Harbor, other Navy assets were transferred out of the Pacific into the Atlantic. There was times in the Pacific that there was only one aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, between America and Japan. And we built Battle Midway. We had two and a half aircraft carriers because one of them they were repairing is it was sailing from Pearl Harbor down to Midway. Took out four of Japan's six aircraft carriers. And basically, even though we were doing almost nothing in the Pacific, we turned them around and we were on the offensive June 1942. And then we did island hopping. I don't want to minimize what the soldiers and sailors did during World War II. But let's just did you really step back? What did we do? World War One? When did we get into World War One? 1917. When did World War Two? When did World War One end? 1918. 1918. So there's a whole lot going on. We come in in the end, putting on our cavalry hats, riding to the rescue. World War Two. We come in in the end. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's just. I'm not even talking about. George Washington shadow boxing for five years, but anyway. Okay, so anyway, you asked one question. But so, so, okay, so if you're a guy over age 65 and you've been nursing home, target rich environments, right? Okay. Jesus Christ. Yes. Go around. Oh, it's okay. So, um, just a lot for the fun of it. Our population in the United States right now is 62% white. This is as of 2014. These numbers are shrinking. I really need, I can't wait for them to get the next census out. They know uh, I just was hearing something today that that's going to be more of a train wreck. 62% of Americans are white, 13% African American. 17.4% Hispanic. African Americans were the largest minority in the United States. They were the number two group on that chart until the early 2010. 2010. I can't remember the exact year, maybe from 2008. It hadn't been, I mean, it hadn't been that long ago, but the Hispanic population is now 17.4% and growing fast. African American population is 13.2% and growing faster than the white population. What's this graph going to look like in another 30 years? 
Hispanics are going to be number one. African Americans are going to be number two. White folk are going to be number three. Yes. Because remember, among other things, Hispanics have larger families. White folk, they go off to college. What do you do when you go off to college? You wait on having kids. So guess what? White folk are having, in a century, in a hundred year span, white folk are having four generations. You, you know, you go to school, you get out of college when you're 22 or whatever, and you go, you find a job, and you get engaged at 23, you get married at 24, you have a first kid at age 25, right? So white folk are having a generation, four of them in a century. African Americans and Hispanics are having like five. Because not as many of them are going off to college, not as many of them are waiting, so what ends up happening, maybe they're starting at age 20 on average. So let's say everybody has two kids. White folk are going from two to four to eight to 16 to 32. Where the African Americans would be going two to four to eight to 16 to 32 to 64 to 128. Did I count that right? Anyway. But then, ooh, but Hispanics, instead of going two, four, six, eight, they're going from two to eight to 32 to 120, because they're having four or five, six kids per family. That's just, so these curves are growing better. So is that going to change what's happening in our economy? Yes. Is that, why? Is it, is, is it saying anything qualitatively about any of these groups? Are any, are any of these groups better than any of the other? No. But things are going to change. Because, okay, if you know Hispanics continue to grow and Hispanics believe in bigger families, well, then bigger families is kind of going to be a thing. So then grocery stores got to start planning on more family sized meals and that kind of thing. Well, right now, what are they doing? We talked about this in the marketing class last week. They're going for smaller meal packaging. Because most of the people around here are still, you're talking single moms with a couple of kids or rifle with you know, 2.5 people, whatever. So you don't have the need for a big, huge family size. And the percentage of single people, I'll probably have this on very next slide, the percentage of single people is growing dramatically in the United States. So family size meals, well, we don't need them so much. Now, 20 years from now, family size meals, well, we're going to need them. Right? Unless the values of the Hispanic population changes. Unless it's the, just that's just, no, it's going to be different. So, right now, and we kind of talked about this before, the percentage of workers for every person, workers putting money into the social security bucket, for every one person taking money out of the social security bucket. Back in the, my chart is screwed up. Uh, this is like 1950, I think it is. Like 1950, I've got, I'll fix that slide at some point. Uh, there's like five workers putting money into social security for every one person taking out. Um, the, as you get to like 2020, it's getting down to like two people putting money in for every one taking out. And then those ones that are taking out are taking out for a longer, longer, longer period of time. As you get older, as you get older, you have expenses that increase. As you get older, you start falling apart. That's what you mean. As you get older, you start falling apart. So the amount of money you have to spend uh, in the hospital goes up. The need for spending in nursing homes and that kind of stuff, long-term healthcare goes up. Right now, people under population, people under five or people under 10 is like 15% of the population, but they're not using very much of the hospital expenses or the um, nursing home expenses. How many one-year-olds do y'all know in a nursing home? But what ends up happening is the population grows, but then we start getting, it starts tailing off because our, they start dying off. 
getting unhealthier and starting to go. But hospital expenses doesn't really start going up until what? Between 15 and 25. Why? The one expense there is to start having kids. And then expenses just sort of keep going up because then you start you're driving as well, getting in car accidents. You're doing something stupid and somebody punches you in the jaw and breaks your jaw and then you have to go to the hospital and have your wire shut. Your jaw wired shut. Actually, they don't punch you in the jaw, they hit you in the jaw with a baseball bat. My brother, it was the best Christmas ever. Anyway. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I am short. But these expenses, they sort of progressively go up over time. Especially yeah, once you start getting into the 55, 60, 65 range, they start going up dramatically. Nursing home expenses. Let's see, what's that? Less than 10% of nursing home expenses is being spent on people less than 65 years old. The nursing home? Cheap. No, it's healthcare. Cheap. I think I told you all at some point this semester the two fastest growing expenses in the economy today is college tuition and healthcare costs. And so, what happens as you get older? I ain't worried about health, not any college tuition anymore. But what's happening? You're getting older, you're getting unhealthier, you need more health care. And so your health care spending is going up. A whole lot higher health care expenses for your grandmother than it is for you. But if you and grandma are making the same paycheck, grandma's got it a lot harder. The group over age 65, just as far as baby boomers, what's going on. In 2015, that group was 46.2 million people. By 2020, it's going to jump all the way up to 56 million. That's you. That's the beginning of the baby boomers sliding in. By 2040, all the baby, all the baby boomers will be in there. That group is going to be 64 million. And by the time you get to, to 2060, it's 72 million. So you're going to get humongo growth already starting now in this category the 2020-2040 big growth and these people are going to need health care these people are going to need long-term nursing health care nursing care and that kind of stuff so if you don't know what to do when you grow up you want job security something to think about there's going to be a large group of people that are demanding health care and long-term you know, nursing health care that kind of thing and as this happens, of course, these people are going to be asking for social security checks and more money is going to be spent on health care. Uh, well, yes. Yes, you're saying by 2035, you know, social security and stuff, for example, people want to see get social security, so they get it. But that means that they're going to be taxing us to pay for the social security. Don't know what they're going to do. We don't know how they're going to fix it. They haven't decided, and they keep ignoring it. The that's going to be the thing. Are they going to? The longer they wait, the harder it's going to be to fix it. Because it's, the people who get it still going to get it even as you flip it. Not necessarily. And that's they really don't have a plan for how it's going to work out. But it just if things keep going the way it's going now by twenty thirty four, that what it's going to be ending. Uh, at 2034, I'm just going to be able to stick my hand in that bucket. Crap. I really actually could not have done that man. I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I would be, I would qualify pretty early, but I won't be old enough to get it later. Yeah. Okay. So, guess what? Medicare. As healthcare for old people, what's going to happen? Medicare spending on Medicare is going to be going up by fifty percent, right? Because we're going to have fifty percent more people in twenty forty than we got right now that are over sixty five needing healthcare and being paid for by the U.S. government. And where's the government going to get the money to pay that? Pay those bills? Taxes are going to have to go up sometime. 
or else they're going to start and say, sorry, um, you don't qualify, you, yeah, you're old, but you don't get Medicare anymore. So a long line, they need to adjust, if they're going to adjust it, they need to adjust now, say, okay, everybody that's, you know, 50, if you, if you age between 30, if you're born between 19, 70, 1990, well, you don't get Medicare until you turn 70. If you're born after 1990, then you don't get Medicare until you turn 80. But they need to do something like that. Or if they're going to keep with that promise of everybody wants to turn 65, you get health care, then they got to pay those bills. And the only way they pay those bills is they've got to raise our taxes. Same thing for the Social Security. They either got to increase when we can collect it, or they got to take more money away from us, get the money to pay the people. And the longer they wait, the harder it can be fixed. It. For those of y'all that were in my finance class, in the finance class yesterday, we had a lady in here that was talking savings and that kind of stuff. And I can't, I wish I could remember, but the one number she had there was like, you even waiting a year to start saving for retirement and interestingly increase how much you need to save each month every extra year. Every extra year that they wait to fix, figure out how they can fix our security is going to be that much less time to come up with a solution and have that solution go into effect and work and grow and fix the problem. So healthcare spending is a percentage of the GDP. The United States is actually a leader there. We spend more money on healthcare is a percentage for our economy than most other countries in the world. Most of these are all in the UK. Yeah. France, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, Japan, United States, United Kingdom, UK, Sweden, Italy, and Australia. What do they all have in common? European Union. Well, mostly they're Europe. Um, Canada's not. But, yeah, but they're socialized medicine. Again, just pretend like I spelled that correctly. Socialized medicine. Oh, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Uh, basically, everybody's on Medicare would be the equivalent. Not just old people, but everybody gets health care paid for by the government. Young, old, everybody. So what ends up happening there is where's that money coming from? Taxes. Here in the United States, we gripe among some of y'all aren't paying any taxes, some of y'all paying 15%, some of you paying 25%. It is not at all uncommon to some of these countries the tax rate is like 60%. Over half of your paycheck each month goes to the government. But you're okay with that because hey, you get health care. But then the which I'm sure I get to it. So I'll say it now because I'm here, there, anyway. Um, healthcare in those countries, the, the government's running the healthcare industry. So everybody, all the doctors, all the nurses, all the, everybody, they are government employees. How good is government pay in quarters? I'm not that, that, that correct. So what happens to the smartest and best? Do they become doctors? No, absolutely. Here in the United States, the smartest and best become doctors because they make several hundred thousand dollars a year. They're not so much. They're government employees. The so socialized medicine system it doesn't pay the work. It doesn't pay the workers as well. It doesn't pay the companies as well. There's no insurance companies, whatever that kind of stuff. So where is the innovation coming? Where's the new drugs being invented? Where's the new machines being invented? In the United States. Because the companies know we can invent something new and it's going to be okay because it's going to pay off because we're going to make money off of it. Whereas in a lot of those other countries, it's just the government. And so there's no incentive for improvement. There's no incentive for people to really roll up their sleeves, get serious about medical school, and become the best doctor that I can. What, what do you call the person who graduates last in their class from medical school? Doctor. Doctor. So as long as you pass, that's good enough. Because I got the word doctor, I'm working for the government, boom. We're here. You know, we're we're going to go to the good doctor, not the bad doctor. 
Even if we had to pay more to go for the good doctor that is supposed to pay, well, you can go to the good one, right? And you can pay more, right? That's the kind of thing that we have here. You have people from all of these countries that always have money and they've got something serious going on, what do they do? They don't need nice things if their medical issues taken care of. Charles Iran in 1979, I can't remember what it was, he had cancer makes up. He ended up coming to the United States and like, woohoo, that's the time we can overthrow the country. And that's when Khomeini and them all day overthrew the country. The American hospitals were taken 444 days. Y'all remember all that? Movie Argo, yeah, that's the end. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because their leader had a health problem and left the country. And came to the United States to get it treated because he didn't trust his doctors. Because his doctors are being paid the way his teachers are. Well, this is how good do we do with the teachers we have in the United States? How good is our school system in the United States? Do we want our health care to be operating the same way as our middle school? That's the consideration there when it comes to socialized medicine. So we didn't put it in perspective. Yes, uh, to, to, that's the thought there. Yeah, we pay more across the board, kind of on average, but you kind of get what you pay for. And if you, everybody had health care free no matter what, there's probably going to be more people going to the hospitals than maybe necessary. If you get if you get paper cut and you know it's going to cost you money to go to the hospital, what are you going to do? You can look at it and say, okay, and you keep going. But if somebody else is going to pay the bills, so you get a paper cut. Well, there's one percent chance this doctor will get infected, and so you know I might as well go ahead and go. Better to be safe than sorry. That's what you get. I'm so paying sixty percent of my paycheck. Yes, I'm paying for it. Yeah, you just taking it out of my check. Might as well. So, uh, healthcare expenditures. Where's this money going to that the government and the health insurance companies are paying out? Where's it going? Thirty-two percent of it with the hospital care. Only twenty percent to physicians and clinics. That's the doctors that are offices that put in the hospital. 4% dental, 9% prescription drugs, 5% for the nursing home, and that's life's going to be getting bigger going forward. Home health care is 3%. That number's going to be getting bigger. Uh, 2%. That looks like a lot of Yeah, so, yeah it's just pointing to the, because that's what I think this theory is supposed to be over here. Okay. Okay. Uh, 3% for home health care, other, other medical products, whatever that is. Uh, two percent, six percent investment, investing in new technologies, new buildings, new whatever. Uh, public health activity, doing things like I don't know, giving out free condoms to the high school kids, that kind of stuff. That's part of it. Um, administration, the paperwork expenses. Administration is seven percent of it. So one out of every twelve dollars that you're spending when you go to the hospital is to pay the people. That are filling out the paperwork. But where's that money coming from? The number one is only a third of it is private insurance. Private insurance. This is money when you go to the insurance company and you say, I'd like a health insurance plan. Or the, if you get a job and your employer gives you health insurance, well, they don't give it to you, they're providing it for you, and you've got to pay some other problem. But that's it. How many people, how many of you parents got health insurance to work? And all, and all the health insurance for all those people that are working on that's only a third of where the money comes from. 12% um, out of pocket. We can talk, talk about all of that probably next time. 8% uh, is other private expenses. Medicare is 20%. Medicaid is 15%. Um, other federal programs and Four percent, and then state and local government is the last eight percent. So it's good. More people retire and get Medicaid. Yeah, older people. Yes. So the Medicare slice is going to be getting bigger as the baby boomers start retiring, which potentially is going to actually shrink this one because they're retiring. They're going to be like, "Woohoo, Medicare!" So I don't have to fight pay my buy my own insurance. But this, but just think about it. I was talking and telling a story about socialized medicine, somebody else is paying the bill, so hey, you might as well. Only 12% of it's coming out of our pocket anyway. Part of that is the, you know when you go to the doctor, you gotta pay that $20? Go 
And then the, the copay, and then the insurance company pays for us. That's part of that. But then the other part of that 12% is the money being paid by people that don't have insurance. You break your arm now, you pay $20 or $20 to your doctor, $20 or emergency room fee, and that's it. Where somebody that doesn't have insurance, they break their arm, they're going to be paying $500, $1,000, $1,500 if they got a baby, if it gets x ray stuff. And so they got to set up a payment plan, start paying for however many months and years. Um, let me okay. I'll say this. Hey, you are yourself. You don't have health insurance, get it. As long as you sponge off, you can sponge off of your parents' health insurance until you're 26. Sponge off of them. Make sure you don't make them mad enough to where they're where you're no son of mine anymore, and they kick you off of your insurance. Their insurance. Be at least nice enough to do that. After you turn 26, if your employer doesn't get you health insurance, get health insurance. Have any of y'all ever seen the, have any of y'all ever gone to a doctor or hospital or anything like that? And you've seen the yeah, EOB, the explanation of benefits. This little letter thing, piece of paper that they mail you, it's an explanation of benefits, and it lists what, it, it's a little table. And it tells you over here on the left hand side what, where you went, you know, what you did. You know, it's like Josie went to the uh, South Hill emergency room and broke an arm. So it's like, you know, arm setting, x ray, and Tylenol. Right. And then over here, it's the, it, the first column is total expense. How much does it cost for the x ray? How much does it cost for the Tylenol? How much does it cost for the doctor? But then they start doing the uh, in network savings. Because you have health insurance with a doctor, with, with the insurance company that the doctor works with. So there's a deduction. They're going to call it allowable charges. The insurance company doesn't deal with the doctors saying, we're going to guarantee you get paid and paid quickly. Because let's face it, Joseph Burke. So if she breaks her arm and something like that and you send her a bill for $1,500, what's she going to do? She can pay $20 a year for the next 30 years. Good luck with that. So what we'll do is we'll pay for her. You get money for her quickly, but you got to sell it to us for a bulk discount. And the doctors agree to that because yeah, they may try to get fifteen hundred dollars out of her over the next twenty years, but instead they would rather take five hundred dollars now. So that's the deal that gets negotiated between the doctors and the hospital. So it's say allowable charge five hundred on a fifteen hundred dollar procedure. If Josie didn't have insurance, she's got to pay the whole fifteen hundred. But then it's like allowable charge five hundred, and then they're going to subtract out any in-network savings because the, it was a preferred doctor instead of one that's outside the network and that kind of stuff. Some more savings and that kind of stuff. So it may end up working out that fifteen hundred dollar charge, fifteen hundred dollar thing to get her arm fixed. The insurance company might end up paying two hundred and fifty, and then she paid her twenty dollars at the door. She all total is 270 only 20 comes out of her pocket because she had health insurance. If she didn't have health insurance, the whole thing, 1500 and you got to pay it all. And I'm not exaggerating at all on those numbers. The only thing I'm wrong on is probably saying it's only $1,500 to get a broken arm split. It's probably more than that. And part of the thing is, well, they're going to be like, well, if you're insured, we know we're getting paid. Josie? I don't know that you're going to pay me. So what's the odds that she's going to pay? 12%. Uh, I'm going to say it's a 20% change she's going to pay. 20% change Carrie's going to pay. 20% chance Connor's going to pay. So 20% chance of Will and Matthew are going to pay. So if I charge each of them $1,500 for a $300 procedure, well, guess what? If one out of five of them pays, I get that $1,500. The same I would have gotten if I would have got $300, $300, $300, $300, $300. That is part of it. You don't have insurance, you're helping to pay the bill, your bill is so high to help offset the expenses of other people that don't have insurance too, because they see you just as risky as they are. 
of course, you for health insurance who, who have health insurance are helping to pay for other people who are un, less healthy than you because you're in this little pool. But have health insurance, get health insurance. Yeah, right now you think you are young and bulletproof. You probably are. Oh, maybe not bulletproof for you. I, I, I was when I was working construction work for a couple of years. I looked at the health insurance on less expensive, and I didn't have it when I was doing construction work. Not the best idea, especially when I was working with Amy. Not the best idea. But which is better to cough up a hundred, couple hundred dollars a month, or suddenly end up getting this fifty thousand dollar bill? Better to be paying a couple hundred dollars a month, right? And then you don't have to worry about it. That's the point of insurance. If you don't have health insurance, go pay nice to your parents. Get back on your insurance plan. I believe you're 26. And when you get 26, get health insurance. Try your best to get an employer that's going to provide health insurance for you. And who? The two fastest growing expenses in the US economy tuition and health care. So, guess what? Right now, and retirement is pretty expensive. You, a lot of businesses aren't providing retirement anymore. What's probably going to be going away next? Health insurance. Employer provided health insurance. They're probably going to do the same thing. If you want health insurance, we'll help you get it. We're not going to give it to you. But you get in on some kind of insurance premium, insurance thing, 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 and we'll pay half of your premium. We'll pay two thirds of it, whatever that number is. The days of Company provided blanket 100% insurance is probably on its way out. I say right now, the government's paying, the state government's paying 90% of mine. I gotta pay the other 10 percent But that number's probably gonna get dramatic. And the state, a lot of businesses are gonna, we're gonna get out of it completely. You go get your own. If you get health insurance, you show us you got health insurance, we'll pay you $500 a month or something like that. And if you don't pay your health insurance bill, that's on you, but that's, that, and that's the way a lot of employees are. Probably gonna start going in the next few years. So businesses that are not required to offer insurance. Obamacare, Affordable Health Care Act. Yes, if you've got a certain number of employees and they're working a certain number of hours, you've got to provide health insurance for them. Which is why a lot of you minimum wage workers, uh, whatever, are part-time workers are only working 29 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week. Because if you work 29 hours a week, you're part-time, and we don't have to give you health insurance. If you're working 40 hours a week, you're full-time, we have to give you health insurance, and that's a huge expense. Better to have four part-time workers, not spend any health insurance, money on health insurance, than have three full-time workers, and then have to provide health insurance for them. Evil? I don't know if I go that far. Reality? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, we will put a bow on this one in class. Wednesday. Thursday, Thursday.